Hello, my name is Larry Beckwith and I'm the artistic producer of Confluence Concerts. It was a great pleasure to meet up with Professor William Blissett a few days after the celebration of his 100th birthday in the Library of the Arts and Letters Club in downtown Toronto in October for a short but wide-ranging interview about the role that music has played in his life. William Frank Blissett was born on October 11th, 1921 in East End, Saskatchewan. He received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of British Columbia in 1943 and went on to do graduate work at the University of Toronto, earning his master's in 1946 and his PhD in 1950. He taught English at the University of Saskatchewan from 1950 to 1960, was a professor and head of the Department of English at Huron College at the University of Western Ontario from 1960 to 1965, a professor of English at the University of Toronto from 1965 to 1987, and has been a professor emeritus there since 1987. I was a student in his final modern drama class in 1986, and his brilliant, well-researched, witty lectures were a revelation, giving us lucky listeners a deep insight into the works of Chekhov, Ibsen, Strindberg, Elliot Shaw, and so many other wonderful playwrights of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I was impressed by how often he managed to weave musical content into his presentations. It was clear that music meant a great deal to him and still does today. Professor Blissett began attending concerts that I was involved in in the late 1980s and has been a loyal and encouraging supporter ever since. I'm always interested in his perspective and critical assessments of our programs. To begin our conversation, I asked Professor Blissett to speak a bit about his early experiences with the medium of radio. I was in there very, very early. Some neighbors had the first, first uh, radio in the neighborhood, and they helped us over for the American election of 1928. And so my first recollection of, of, of um, radio was to hear the victory of Herbert Hoover over Al Smith. But um, there was no stopping radio. And fairly soon, when I was down in California for eight years, my, my mother took me down there after I uh, had a very serious um, childhood illnesses, pneumonia. And um, we, we got a radio, and I can remember listening as a child to um, the American Album of Familiar Music, which ran for years. It was very uh, acceptable and uh, pleasant, though every I realize now, every week, there would be something about growing old. Mm -hmm. Darling, we are growing old, silver threads among the gold, it comes back to me. And uh, just a song at twilight when the lamps are low, and the flickering shadows softly come and go. Love's old sweet song. And there are several others. The, the Americans came out at the early years of the 20th century with a whole raft of uh, songs about aging and about love. And nostalgia, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And the, the only other thing I remember from years of listening to this half an hour every Sunday night was um, Nelson Eddy's uh, great contribution, right. Shortening Bread. Mm -hmm. And uh, then that was the those were the early days of radio. The the great days of radio were the thirties and forties. And um, then uh, I had the good fortune of being in school in California, which was very up to date and experimental. And uh, the Californian children had on Thursday morning half hour standard school broadcast, standard, standard 
Oil Company of California, uh -huh. the Standard Symphony Orchestra. And that, that would be the introduction, it would be the introduction to their full hour uh, in the evening. And uh, I, I was introduced to it by the, by the school system, and it was very enlightening. They did, gave uh, just pointers as to how to move into the world of symphonic music. Hmm. And uh, then you would hear the same thing, you see, at greater length um, in, the, in the evening. And that was years. But you had been primed. And then at that, uh, from the beginning, I, I wanted to hear the, uh, the evening uh, grown-up symphonies. And then that took me almost immediately to the uh, uh, CBC's um, Sunday broadcast of the New York Philharmonic, an hour and a half every Sunday. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can build a very good program around about 100, an hour and a half. I even heard, I think, once a Mahler symphony, which took the whole time. Mm -hmm. Can you remember any other repertoire that stuck out to you as Oh, no, I, I, what I, I do remember, it, 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 and what I remember really is the standard repertoire, the Beethoven symphonies, m minus the, the ninth, it was very seldom done because mm -hmm. it was too long. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Haydn symphony could be done any time. Mm -hmm. They're all the same, but they're all good. They are. And Haydn is one of the two happy masters. Haydn was happy, contented, and uh, Handel was happy, boisterous. But they, you can count on happiness. But what about Haydn's Sturm und Drang? How was that happy? I don't know it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I just meant he was, uh, he was also just concerned with... Don't I, we think of him as the seeds of German romanticism? I think he had a, a, a worry in his head. Okay, okay. He well, was, he, uh, 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 well fixed with the Esterhazys. That's true. And uh, he was a superior servant, mm -hmm. but very superior. And uh, uh, the head of, of uh, a large establishment yes. would, would be respected. Yeah. What about the Metropolitan Opera broadcasts? When did they come uh, into your... Very seldom. I okay. wasn't into opera the way I was into symphony. Mm -hmm. Symphony was what I discovered first, mm -hmm. and uh, that... Uh, so that I, I... When I look at the program for the Toronto Symphony Orchestra over the year, I can see that I know nine-tenths of the things mm -hmm. from these years of hearing three symphonies a year, a, a week, uh, uh, what when I go to the R T S O, I always uh, pump for a Bruckner or a Mahler mm -hmm. because they, they were never done because of the time restrictions. Of their length, right? Mm -hmm. When you so as your career developed as a literary scholar, mm -hmm. how how did music play a, a role in that in your professional? work? Well, um, it, it, uh, one very specific role. All my years of, of, of listening to um, radio symphonies, at the end of the program they would announce the next uh, week's program. And I can just hear the wheedling voice of the radio announcer saying, next week as a special treat, we will have an old Wagner program. And my heart would sink, because I didn't like Wagner, and I didn't like chunks of Wagner, and I was not keen on opera, uh, but um, my literary studies were such that I had moved into T.S. Eliot, so, uh, uh, Friedrich der Wind, der Heimat zu, mein Irisch Kind, well, what is du? Ut und leer das Meer. And it registered with me, I'd like to hear the actual 
passages in Tristan that it came from. Uh, and then uh, I said, why if Wagner, if um, Eliot took Wagner so seriously, and Joyce took Wagner so seriously, and Virginia Woolf actually went to Wagner, uh, to Bayreuth, and uh, reviewed the season for the Times, uh, and I uh, could go through a long, long list of literary people who were Wagnerites. Why is it that Wagner has never registered with me? And uh, overhearing this, Rudolf Bing said, I'm going to do the ring. And he did the ring, uh, uh, the ring uh, four consecutive Saturday afternoons. And I equipped myself with the piano vocal score, which I could follow with difficulty. And uh, I was knocked over by, by Das Rheingold. It was just everything that I, uh, that, that I had uh, missed, not hearing anything but little chunks of Wagner. The, the, con the consecutiveness of it and the, uh, the detail and the way the details fitted, all that came across as those chunks never did. And uh, the next week was Devalkyrie and I was coming down with the flu and I listened to it in bed and I dreamt about it wildly, a whole night. Hmm. And I was a Wagnerite from that time on. And I uh, took every opportunity to... Well, no, the first Wagner that I saw produced was 1958. This was 1950, I think, the Bing thing. The 58, I had my sabbatical and I began it by going to Bayreuth, the Ring, Tristan, and Parsifal, and the high, high time of Wieland Wagner. And uh, then I got there, there 11 years later, 69, uh, Ring, Tristan, and Parsifal, and Meistersinger, and uh, both times were Wieland. The 69, I think, was the last year that they did Vivian's production. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to say that I saw it twice. The, the two, my two bar rights were both Vivian. And that was overwhelming because it actually to be there mm -hmm. and be surrounded by the pilgrims, as the, the French called themselves, mm -hmm. it was marvelous. And uh, so I, uh, I had two rings at, at Maroy, one in London, one in Toronto, and uh, the, uh, there was a, a television one from the Met, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. That. Yes. yes. And I, I, I picked up the four, the, each of the four as part of a different cycle uh, just a miscellaneous ring. That's not bad, but I've not uh, seen a ring since our own one that opened the, uh, the uh, uh, theater. And what is it to be a Wagnerite? What is it to be totally immersed in? Well, total immersion is a good way to start it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it, it. And it did make sense to me as a literary scholar with a second, my first preoccupation was Renaissance, but uh, modernism was my second, and the major modernist classics are very, very inclusive, you have to give yourself to them fully, mm -hmm. and, the, and as Eliot says, they are difficult, and the sheer, sheer volume of Wagner, the length of time of every opera, every music drama, uh, is, is much, much more difficult than, say, say uh, even so great a composer as Verdi. 
And Mozart is, is great, but it doesn't set out to be difficult. Uh, in, 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 yeah, uh, there are great subtleties in, in uh, Mozart, but no difficulties in mm -hmm. Mozart. Mm -hmm. May I be bold enough to ask what you feel Wagner has to offer a listener or a viewer in 2021? I just don't know because I don't know what authors in 2021 are doing. Um, in, um, in, 19, in 1921, uh, the major modernists were emerging. It was the year of Ulysses and it was the year of the Wasteland and they were much talked about and much resisted. But in 2021, is there any major um, literary controversy going on? People talk about postmodernism. Can we give me an example of postmodernism? How is it different from modernism? By being post, of course. Mm -hmm. And postmodernism was invented before there was any postmodernist. Post uh, um, uh, repertoire. Well, these are questions for literary people. Literary people, but I suppose what I was driving at is uh, we are we do live in an age of of equity and inclusion and um, reevaluating uh, some of the older works, uh, the works of the standard repertoire, and calling out certain uh, inconsistencies in... Well, in, we've uh, not done that. We've done that, it's true. We for have done that. Time. We have done that for a long time. I, I lived through the whole of the, um, the recovery of the early music. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've heard all... I've, I've seen produced all the operas of Monteverdi, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. That's a sort of lifetime thing, mm -hmm. people in the, before the middle of the 20th century would never see a Monteverdi. Yeah, that's true. What about choral music, specifically um, uh, sacred choral music? I know you're... Yeah. Uh, well, there, uh, that depended on my discovering uh, this highly musical church, um, St. Mary Magdalene, which introduced me. I remember by turning up there the, for Evensong, the Sunday after Ascension, 1946. And I can remember the, the moment in which the, uh, the, the, um, I heard my first live plain song, and then I heard my first live uh, Renaissance music from a, bal a, a, a balcony, mm -hmm. balcony choir, and uh, I've heard many and many an example of each since. And it was thrilling, I imagine. Yes, it was. As for uh, choral music, I, uh, for for a while, the director of music at um, at SMM was um, Stephanie Martin who was very, very keen on the oratorio, and uh, she had her own group, and I heard more oratorios in that rather brief period of a few years than all the rest of my life. I haven't heard one since she left. Uh, is she still in Toronto? Is she she is, yes. teaches at York University, and... I know she teaches at York. Spending a good deal of time composing Herself, she is composing herself. I now. like her poems. I mean, yes, she wrote, she wrote quite a few church things for right. SMM. Yeah. Though so I would still like the uh, the Russian contagion to be sung at uh, my event mm -hmm. rather than hers. I think hers is very fine, mm -hmm. but um, I can remember that the one dear friend of mine, Reed McCallum, uh, professor of philosophy. And uh, he, when I first knew him, he was um, uh, 
uh, award in the SMM when I first entered SMM, and I knew him and his, his family very well. And uh, I edited his uh, posthumous papers. And when he died, he died just about the time I took my PhD. I think it was the same week that I had the, my mm. final ball at the Green guy. And they sang the Russian Kontakion there, and I would, uh, would like to have that rather than anything else, how, no matter how good. So you knew Haley Willett then? You must have well, you, uh, people, uh, some people knew Haley Willett. I uh, recognized Haley Willett. I'd see him every Sunday. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, uh, also, he used to give um, uh, organ recitals and, and uh, choral recitals, uh, and he'd speak very, very well and amusingly often. But uh, in my my time there, the four years from 1945 to 50, then I was away 15 years, 10 years in Saskatchewan and five at Huron College. And I came back in '65, mm. and uh, Hilly Willen had how many years? A year or two, and uh, it was good to be back and uh, see him again. Mm -hmm. But we never exchanged a word. Oh. And in his time, uh, there was um, a coffee hour in the uh, in the church at the end of the high mass restricted to the choir, oh. or maybe the servers, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the um, people uh, dispersed. So I never met him, but I'd recognize him anywhere. Do you have, I mean, you've uh, intimated that Wagner has meant a great deal to you through the years. Do you have a, a favorite composer Favorite living composer? Well, well, who is living? <laughs> John Beckwith. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. Very much so. But uh, uh, Murray Daskin is not living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I knew Murray very well in Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there when he was appointed. And, uh, of course, Francis James and Jory did a, a pretty good uh, musical program mm -hmm. centered at the university and were very attractive characters. But if you were to put on a, a favorite piece of music at home, what, what, would, you, what would you play? Oh, I, I would play the, um, the Schubert uh, string quintet. Beautiful piece. Isn't it? Yeah. So that uh, if you want a, a, a sort of memorial thing, uh, I don't. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's only fair if I uh, tell you what my ambition is. I don't want to live, having lived to be a hundred. I'd like to live to be a hundred and forty-four. Okay, now that's a nice no mm -hmm. number, nicer number than not than hundred. Mm -hmm. Much richer. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in 44 years, uh, you might play that. All right. That was an interview conducted in the Library of the Arts and Letters Club in downtown Toronto in October of this year on the occasion of the 100th birthday of Professor William Blissett. My name is Larry Beckwith and I am the producer of Confluence Concerts. Thank you so much for watching.